Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we carry on visiting in the area of Leicestershire and we take a wander around the remains of Grace Dew Priory. This was a 12th century Augustinian nunnery that was sadly dissolved in 1538 by Henry VIII. The eerie yet beautiful remains include earthworks that once suggested that there were the all-important fish ponds, a partially complete undercroft and plenty of Tudor architecture. The site is very well known for its resident ghosts, and in particular a tale of the White Lady, so join us for an explore here at Grace Dew Priory. The exact date is not well known, but it was more than likely that it was built between 1235 to 1241. Its founder was Rosia, or Rose de Verdun, who had granted income from the manors of Kirby and Belton to be able to provide for a community of nuns that were dedicated to the Holy Trinity and St Mary. Rose was the daughter of Nicholas de Verdun, who owned some of the nearby estates in Belton. Located on the outskirts of the Charnwood Forest, the Priory was built on this estate, and it would have more than likely started out with around 12 nuns. It is one of only two female priories in Leicestershire. In French, the term Grace of God translates as Grace Dew, which was how they decided to give the Priory its well-known name. In the field around the Priory, and to the west, is an ancient standing stone that suggests that the area was a space for local spiritual significance, way long before the Priory was ever founded. Its founder, Rose, was buried before the altar in the Priory's chapel, but her tomb lays peacefully at the parish church at St John in Belton, where it can still be seen. The community here at Grace Dew was under strict rule of a prioress. Its first prioress was Agnes de Gresley, although little is known about her, but historians suspect that she wasn't up to the role and was way too laid back, so it was passed on to Mary de Streeton. Weirdly enough, an unusual rule here meant that the nuns of the priory were to never leave the priory's precinct, and they were to be independent of outside control. The nuns called themselves the White Nuns of St Augustine, and they wore undyed white wool robes, as opposed to the traditional black habits that were worn by most Augustinian nuns but it's thought that there are no other houses of their order in the country. The Priory at the time was fairly large, and it was home to around 16 nuns. It also had an attached hospital, which had beds and cared for around 12 poor people. An account book from 1414 provides a great insight into the Priory's way of life and their economy. It had notes of income from rent that was given, the mill, the lime workings, quarries, as well as the other supplies like timber, wool, pigs, cattle and sheep. There was also a note of various maintenance work that was carried out, including the repair of the roof of the cloisters and the church.
The Priory escaped the first wave of dissolution of the smaller monasteries, whilst the nuns received several donations from local lords of neighbouring land, and the most generous of those was John Comyn. The estate continued to grow and grow, right up until the mid-16th century when the dissolution began to take over. A report was compiled together by the King's Commissioner for Leicestershire, John Beaumont. This report provided a final insight into the state of the Priory at the time of the dissolution. Incredibly, what was still left was in a great state of repair and was well maintained. An inventory of the Priory was undertaken and a number of buildings here included a church, a lady chapel, a chapter house, a cloister, areas for hospitality including a knight's chamber, a hall and a dining chamber, as well as the usual service rooms that would have helped keep things running smoothly, with buildings like a bakehouse, a brew house, a laundry room, a smith's forge and a large kitchen. After the dissolution, the Grace Dew estate was purchased by Sir Humphrey Foster on behalf of John Beaumont, who was Henry VIII's commissioner. Beaumont's position as the King's Commissioner meant that he could not reserve or deal with the properties himself, hence the need for Foster procuring the Priory for him. The main Priory complex was converted into a private residence by Beaumont, including the construction of first floor rooms, additions to the chapter house and galleries linking the first floor rooms above the cloisters and the East Range. Most of the buildings of the former Priory were reconstructed in Tudor architectural style, and it became his country house. Around 1690, when the Beaumont line at Grace Dew died out, the estate was sold on to Sir Ambrose Phillips of Garendon, who purchased Grace Dew as an extension to his estate. From this time onwards, their house at Grace Dew fell into a sad state of disrepair. Phillips demolished the Priory Church in 1696, where he stripped the roofs of lead, and so it became a ruin as it is today, which now, fortunately, is managed by the Friends of Grace Dew Priory, who are a charitable group of volunteers who fundraise to care for the site and keep it open to the public for free. The most magnificent structure amongst the ruins today is the Chapter House, with its well-built stone arch entrance. A few scattered fireplaces from the Tudor House are also still standing. There have been several restoration and preservation works that have been undertaken by the Grace Dew Priory Trust, but it seems more has to be done in order to save this stately ruin for our future generations. Recently, just near the railway, the remains of what is believed to be part of the infirmary and the guest house were actually discovered.
Sometimes these forgotten ruins, especially from the medieval period, are interesting to visit, down to the fact that people have labelled the ruins as haunted. More than likely the ghosts and the weird creatures we imagine live only in our minds, but the stories of the lost souls amongst these derelict ruins are always interesting to read about. Some of the stories revolve around multiple female ghosts, dressed sometimes in white, but also in grey, that haunt the buildings. Throughout the years there have been numerous paranormal activities, with incredible finds at the site, as well as reports of uneasy feelings whilst visiting. For me, I felt like there could have been someone watching us as we visited the Priory. We came during the morning, but the feeling of having someone watching over your shoulder was definitely present. Its most famed story involves a prioress who had a child out of wedlock. Sadly, the baby was discovered and drowned by the nuns in the nearby fish pond, and the prioress was walled up inside the priory as her punishment. Some people believe her ghost is the one that still wanders in search for her lost baby, and others have assumption that Rose was disturbed when she was moved from her final resting place. There are plenty of sightings of a ghostly white lady that has no feet, face or hands, and who floats around the ruins as if she is lost. To visit the Priory we opted for the more traditional route and walked through the gorgeous forest. You can park for free at the Bull's Head pub, which is the official car park for the ruins, and simply just follow the signs that point the directions to the Priory. You pass a cricket green and down under two unused and interesting old train line bridges, before you see the picturesque stream and then finally the entrance to the Priory itself. I'd say a visit here is worth the small trek through the stunning woodlands and especially to uncover a slice of this hidden, haunted history. So if you've enjoyed our visit today, please be sure to hit that like button, consider subscribing and joining us on the channel or over on our Patreon. We want to say a big thank you to our channel members and to our Patreons. Thank you for all of your support and a thank you for choosing to watch the channel. So we'll see you in the next one. Till next time.